This week on CrossFeed. Mormon nudist. Did Jesus bleed too? Orange County Christian bikers arrested. Apostles' bones stolen. And your degree is no good here. Hello everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. I am Pastor Jim Butler at St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. Hello everybody, good to be with you this week. Yeah, and actually doing this on a Thursday. Yes, it's kind of scary. <laughs> My daughter went, oh yeah, you have CrossFeed tonight. Wow, on a Thursday, that's kind of weird. <laughs> Kind of weird, you're doing it on a Thursday when you're supposed to do it on a Thursday. Yeah. And it's actually dark behind Dale. Notice this. So we're doing this a little later, so it's actually dark behind yeah. him. So you, you don't see the, 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 the light change this, this time. Speaking of dark, uh, I have to apologize for last week. Um, it went really dark for probably half the show. Uh, right after we did that video clip on the Obama thing, uh, something, I don't know, I clicked on the wrong window or something, but... All of a sudden, I'm looking at the recording, doing the editing, and it just went black. And, well, actually, first it showed, like, just me, and then it went black. And it was like that for most of the show. I'm not sure what happened. It must have something to do with, like, what window you click on or something like that. So I'll be very careful what I click on this time so that doesn't happen again. So I apologize for that. And I'll try not to offend everyone again. Well, speaking of offensive, why don't we just uh, jump okay. in? Uh, We've got several I'll start stories. Start with the Mormon nudists. Okay. Well, you have a picture for this? Oh yeah, I do. Hang on here. I forgot. I'm not used to having to do the pictures of stuff yet, but I'm still there. There he is. There's a guy wanting to do that. Talk about it. All right. Uh, we have. Where did that go? Some His reason. name is uh, uh, Mark Martindale or uh, Michael Martindale, and he is a Mormon, and um, he was speaking in Salt Lake City last year. He is a Mormon, and he is a nudist, and he thinks it's a good thing to do. <laughs> um, now, this runs into two different problems uh, with the Mormons. First of all... Uh, is you know a question of modesty, and also the requirement that faithful Mormons wear their sacred undergarments day and night. You're not supposed to take them off. Well, obviously, if you're a nudist or a naturalist, depending on uh, what uh, terminology you like to use, uh, you can't really do that if you're wearing your sacred undergarments because then you're not nude. Or in his case, the other way around, uh, he wants to be nude, so he. Uh, doesn't wear his sacred undergarments. I'm definitely not wearing my underwear. It's not my underwear. But he has an answer to this. He says it. Um, he feels closer to God when he sheds his clothes, as long as it's in appropriate, respectful settings. Like when he goes hiking naked. Which I really hope he wears hiking boots at least. <laughs> I really hope he doesn't go hiking around here. <laughs> Um, mm-hmm, yeah, anyway, um, you know, it's, it's, now, you know what I found interesting about that? Okay, how do you argue against this if you're, if you're, if you're a Mormon? Uh, because all he has to say is, I had a burning in the bosom, and this is, this is right. That's a good point. You know, it, um, it, as, uh, sort of regular Christians, I guess, um, you know, we can argue about, you know, that, yes, God, when God created Adam and Eve, they didn't have clothes on, but then God clothed them um, because they had something. See, before creation, or uh, I'm sorry, before the fall, um, there was no sin, and therefore they had nothing to be ashamed of. But uh, we have something to be ashamed of now. You know, we have our sin, and 
And while Christ freed us from it, uh, we still need to cover ourselves. Um, and uh, so, but yeah, with the Mormons, you know, it's continuing revelation. So, and, and it's very subjective. You know, we can point to scripture, whereas they really, them pointing to scripture doesn't really mean anything because, you know, scripture can change. Hey, man, this don't feel right. My donkey senses are tingling all over. Yeah, you know, uh, my, uh, huh, of course, when it comes, comes to me, there's a, a lot to be ashamed of there. So, um, and uh, there's some, um, that's all I can tell you about that. But, uh, you know, it's, but his other thing is, uh, some people say it's wrong, uh, because it's not modest. And he says, um, you know, we're actually clothing instead of diffusing lust increases it, creates it. We make certain parts of our bodies more mysterious, more alluring. Um, and so, uh, you know, modesty is a fluid concept. Although, and true modesty, he says, is in the heart and the mind, which really is a certain amount of truth to it. I think it's interesting, he says, you know, what we feel is modest today would have scandalized Brigham Young. What we wear as swimming pool would horrify, you know, would horrify us if we were or church. Agreed. And to a certain extent, Agreed. I think he's right there. And I think he's also right. It is really is a matter of the heart. You know, I don't think you can argue that either. Yeah, but, you know, there's also what I talked about before, and there's also leading others to sin. You know, his comment about um, about creating, uh, um, what was the word, uh, alluring, um, because it's it's hitting it, hiding, hiding it, um, you know, making it more mysterious and that kind of thing. Yeah, there's something to that as well, but it kind of depends because uh, you can wear – certain clothes that do not draw attention to uh, your sexuality, or you can wear certain clothes that do draw attention to that. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of the clothing nowadays people wear do draw uh, attention to their sexuality. And, um, and I don't think that that's really a good thing. Um, at least not in public. And so, uh, and and as far as is it does it diffuse lust um you know being socially nude um i suppose it depends on the person if a person's used to seeing it all the time maybe maybe not um but certainly in a a normal social situation where the majority of the people are not nudists uh, it's definitely going to um, cause them to uh, have their minds wander uh, to those certain parts of the body. The mind wander. Oh, I wonder, wonder. I wonder who. Who wrote the book of love? <laughs> <laughs> That's where my mind wanders. I thought it was interesting how they ended this article. Um, that it said that uh, they have uh, Davy Pace, who is a writer immersed in Utah's dance community. I'm not sure what this has to do with uh, this other guy, Martindale, but um, he said it's important to look at the human body as a work of art in biology and in an erotic context. So we start out the article saying, well, no, it's not a sexual thing at all. And then they end the article by saying, oh, yeah, it's an erotic thing. <laughs> um, isn't that kind of contradicting? Oh, that is nasty. So I don't quite get that. I have no idea what that meant. Well, I, I know. I think he, he what he's saying is, um, you know, it's um, that a little bit, again, the context. He says you can look at it as a work or art um, in biology and in erotic context. And in erotic context, it can fit in all those because it continues. He goes, the use of the nude body in dance and art has a rich history and rhetoric that is useful corollary to, nat to naturism. Um, I mean, you know, if you look at uh, Renaissance paintings and you know, the, you know, those types of things. I keep wondering about that I mean, though. Nothing new in, in art. 
I mean, just because it was done, you know, um, 500 years ago, did how did people look at that artwork back then? You know, nowadays we look at it and go, oh, it's art, you know, Venus to Milo and, you know, and, and, and whatever, and, um, and the David and stuff. And, you know, and, and we look at that and we go, that's art. Okay. But I'm sure that they thought it was art back then, but did they also look at it the way that people look at naked bodies today? You know, I mean, did their minds wander when they looked at those images? I mean, it's, it, I don't know, you know, and it sort of, there was a Simpsons episode a number of years ago where they talked about, uh, the, the David statue and stuff and, you know, is it art and, and should it be covered up and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I just, maybe it's just me, but I know I feel a little uncomfortable. I mean, I can appreciate artwork of, you know, that are these sort of Renaissance nudes and stuff like that. But there's a reason that, um, if you do a nude today, uh, it's not, you know, it, it's different. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I feel uncomfortable, uh, you know, <laughs> don't look too long at it, you know? And I don't know, I mean, maybe it's just me, but, I think there's something to be said for modesty, regardless how old it is. Could be. Could be. I I like modesty, too. I think modesty is a good thing in artwork. Let's talk about Australian artwork. Hey, there you go. Yeah, see, see I can I can come up with a... This is this is a, a, a past painting from it. I, I couldn't find the one that's causing all the uproar. This oh, show. I found I'm it. Sorry. Oh, you did? Yep. Yeah, let's bring it up here. Uh, okay, show it. I, I, I look forward. I tried a couple of little searches, and I couldn't find anything. There we go. It's kind of ugly. It's like it's supposed to be kind of a trip pitch. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like. And this is just, this is all I have of it. But, uh... Okay, well, just, just, just go ahead and leave it up there during the conversation. They don't need to see me. Actually, uh, they, they can, can see you. It. They can't see me from this end. Oh, okay. Oh, good. Then, then they can see, you know, that that picture though. Uh, that's ugly. <laughs> and then, okay, where then somewhere across, uh, is that Alice Cooper song "Only Women Bleed"? Yeah, or just one line of it anyway. Just, just the the title of it. Um, All right. And uh, where I don't even see that in that in it. I'm trying to figure it out too. Is that? It could be what's written on the sign above his head, but that, oh, I don't know. That looks kind of like it's written in Greek. It's, it's hard to tell. So. But anyway, yeah, this is, um, anyway, this, uh, this thing's called the, uh, Blake Prize for Religious Art. And, um, one of their, uh, and it, this is a religious art prize. And, uh, one of the, uh, uh, judges quit over it. I have a Christopher Allen. He resigned from the judging counter because he objected to this. Well, last year, and, uh, there was a statue of the Virgin Mary in a burqa and a, um, a hologram of Christ that shifted into Osama bin Laden. Right? So there was already some controversial stuff associated with this prize. And then along comes this, uh, Adam Cullen is the artist's name. And, uh, he comes up with this image. And, uh, so this Christopher Allen, he said, ah, it's enough. Had it. And he left. So. Now, for those not familiar, um, familiar with the, the song in question. Yeah. It's, it said, uh, only women bleed which is the name of an Alice Cooper song. And this Alice Cooper song is about um, domestic violence. It's about spousal abuse. And um, I, you know, I've been trying to figure out what does Jesus on the cross 
have to do directly? And what kind of a what what is the message that this artist is trying to send? Any ideas? I don't know. He says, uh, I don't know. The guy goes, it's just the Jew on a cross. On the cross. All the other entries would be of a Jew on two bits of wood. It's a very left wing, almost Fudo Femi artwork. How can he be offended? Said Kellen. I mean, this is, it's a religious prize, a religious art prize. So, you know, you're going to have all kinds of pictures of Jesus. And so he's saying, well, this is just one more. I don't even understand what that quote means. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I like the guy. He, the judge also says it's just a deliberately ugly. Well, that it is. Yeah, you know, it's just a deliberately ugly picture. Of Jesus. It, I, I mean, it looks almost might be almost a, a zombie. Because mm-hmm. I've heard people refer to Jesus you know, as that because you know he rose from the dead. Not quite the same though. So, you know, I've, I was I trying know, to figure I out, mean, okay, um, you know, like, is, is he trying to say that, hey, those of you who are persecuted uh, by your spouses, Jesus knows what that's like because his church persecutes him, his, you know, his spouse. <laughs> but then you lose the only women bleed thing because it's backwards. And, um, uh, church being the bride of Christ. And, or is it kind of the other way around saying that in Christianity, somehow spousal abuse is, uh, is allowed or something like that. And that, I don't really understand that either. So I guess I don't really, I just, I don't know, maybe I'm not artsy enough for this show. <laughs> I just don't get it. So I, I don't think it's worth uh, twenty thousand Australian dollars, though, or the eighteen thousand three hundred in American dollars. I wouldn't give you two cents for it myself. But instead of giving two cents for a yeah, a picture there, what if you gave a whole bunch of money? Or a college degree, and then you found out he was no good. So, the North Carolina Central University uh, had an extension program at Bishop Eddie Long's uh, Mega Church New Birth Association. In the picture behind me, that's that's uh, Bishop Eddie Long uh, in his church there, and uh, they had. Uh, 39 students in there, and uh, New New Birth Missionary Baptist Church. And they were taking this degree and discovered that the uh, North Carolina Central uh, University had no authority from the regional accreditation program to um, offer this. And so now... Yeah, these uh, 25 students that attended there get no credit for their work there. So this is kind of a weird thing because the school is saying, well, they never met the uh, the approvals when they – it, it sounds kind of like they launched the program, the satellite program without going through all the proper uh, channels. Yeah. So, I, I don't know. What would you do if if you were taking a class, and specifically if you're offering this, you know, at your church, and then all of a sudden it didn't work? They're trying to get it kind of um, uh, ex post facto, you know, like, well, we'll fill out the paperwork now so that we can get everybody through. But they say, well, no, it's it's not. 
you can't do that. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, well, you know, I have a couple different thoughts. Part of one, number one, because I do a um, teaching an extension program uh, online, and we're sponsored by Concordia University, Concordia College, Bronxville, Concordia University in Portland. Um, you know, that's one of the great problems of often of doing college credit stuff over the internet or in extension courses. Is a lot of times you've got to, you know, make sure that whoever is crediting, accrediting you uh, approves everything that you're doing and that everything that you're doing meets their standards. I mean, it's just that's part of what makes that tough. Um, the other part of me, of course, reading that's in Durham, North Carolina, is where this place is located, and that, of course, is where the famous cross case came from and I, a couple of years ago, and I thought, well, only in Durham. Uh, <laughs> would you have somebody who um, don't make sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed before they launch into this thing? Uh, it's kind of interesting, too. They said that, you know, the, the, the people from the faculty there that were teaching, they all had graduate degrees, but some of them, you know, were teaching in areas that their, their degrees weren't in. And then they had adjunct proper faculty from Atlanta that didn't know it get vetted out, vetted properly. So yeah. I just thought it was kind of strange. So, yeah, if you're, you know, taking courses or, or you know, for that matter, if your church is offering courses, um, you know, <laughs> make sure you go through the proper channels uh, to make sure that these things are being done properly. And, yeah. The problem is this kind of thing, when this goes on, you know, people go, oh, well, you know, churches and education, um, you know, there's several uh, universities out there that don't have very good reputations uh, because they're Christian universities or, or more importantly because of the uh, their founders. Uh, you have like uh, Bob Jones University, Oral Roberts University, you know, they... Um, for various reasons, have kind of a bad name in the uh, public eye. And so when you have, in this case, a state church, but, or I'm sorry, <laughs> state church, a uh, uh, state university, but uh, um, a church being involved in a satellite program, yeah, you got to be real careful. I, I would, well, this is kind of a toughie though, too. Um, when it comes to churches, and I don't know how much the church was directly involved, or if this was just a. Uh, um, uh, it's kind of hard to say. He was a. Um, let's say he's on the uh, board of the trustees of NCCU, and he himself is a graduate of it as well. So apparently, he's got some pull with it. Yeah. So I, he also I'm gave sure a million dollar gift to the university that. last week. Yeah, well, that's the other thing. church did one mm. together, but yeah, he, he apparently got something going there with it. Um, that, that, but I, that, I, I that like to seem kind of odd, though. Yeah, business, criminal justice, and hospitality. How do you do a BA in hospitality? <laughs> I mean, will that qualify you to be a Walmart? <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay, I just offended everybody who has hospitality degrees. I understand that. I got it again. Well, actually, if somebody out there has a hospitality degree, uh, send us a note. Podcast at crossfeednews dot com. We would love to know what what is that, or what is the what's the point of that? Um, or, or is that you know? I wonder if that's like a um, like a hotel manager. Or something like that. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but it's, uh, I, I wondered that one myself. But yeah, here's 25 people spent their money, paid their paid everything, thought these were going to be good degrees, and found out they're not. Although reality is, you know, that doesn't necessarily stop you. I've known a few people. Who, depending on what they want to you know, go on and do in life, I've known people who've managed to do quite well um, 
with non-accredited degrees. Um, there's, uh, there are colleges out there that are not accredited that are still good ones. Uh, I don't know. You might have heard of one of them, Harvard. Oh, yeah. Uh, Harvard, Harvard is not accredited. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, some of the reason people think it's a good school, and uh, I have a, a couple others I can think of, too, actually, that are, that are not accredited, but are uh, still good schools. So um, it does, they, they do exist. But you know, in general, I would say I was getting a, an accredited degree. You know who could really use a hospitality degree, though? The members the of the Set Free Soldiers. Oh, <laughs> you think so? <laughs> they use a few things. <laughs> all right. Now, this is all alleged. Do you have a picture? Oh, yeah. He has to correct me again. I say, I get busy looking at the pictures, you know, the, the story, and I forget about the pictures. There we are. There's the set three soldiers getting busted. <laughs> Man, these are, okay, this is so, a, a Christian motorcycle game. Put that word in quotes, Christian. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that the people involved are not Christians, but uh, whether it's a Christian organization or not, uh, it may have started out as one, but there's some question about whether it still is. Um, because I mean, the leader and half a dozen members were arrested on suspicion of attempted murder. Yeah, but, uh, I mean... Uh, yeah, that, that that just begins it. Uh, this guy's, uh, you know, uh, MySpace page. This guy, the, pre- the president of it, his name is uh, something Aguilar. Uh, what was his first name? Phil. Phil. Phil, Phil Aguilar. Aguilar. 60 Phil. years old. And, yeah, he's got, he calls himself the chief, and it says, Sinner or Saint, you be the judge. And... Uh, says that they've got uh, videos of them uh, uh, getting into fights, uh, carrying guns. Yeah, um, its website features videos of members of fist fights, and uh, you know it's just a very interesting group here. But um, uh, you know, uh, in one one respect, I guess you know, being a good thing, it, you know, ex- being very accepting. Ex-convicts, drug addicts, all kinds of people are part of it, but I'm not sure that there was any spiritual maturity or anything about this. Well, you uh, know, that's my big concern here. Now, um, Aguilar is an ex-con, a uh, former drug addict, served time for child abuse in the 70s, converted to Christianity while he was in prison, became the founding pastor of Set Free Worldwide Ministries in 1982. Um, but, uh, like Jim said, there's a lot of violence associated with these guys. Uh, there's some question about whether they have ties to the Mongols, which is, uh, um, a law biker gang that's been at war with Hell's Angels. And this particular event where he was arrested was, uh, uh seems to have been a knife fight, uh, with the Hell's Angels. Um, you know, they, they try to be tough to attract, you know, they, they, the idea is we want to reach, um, you know, all kinds of people with the gospel and people that wouldn't necessarily be comfortable walking into a church, people that wouldn't necessarily, you know, think of, of religion, period. And, um, and, and so, you know, they kind of go for the, uh, the, the rough approach. Uh, problem is, is there's a line. You know, um, St. Paul talked about being a Jew to the Jews and the Greeks to the, uh, a Greek to the Greeks. Um, but boy, there comes a point where you have to stop. You know, uh, he didn't, while he tried to be all things to all people, um, you know, kind of meet people where they're at, uh, at the same time, he didn't go and frequent the bathhouses, you know, so there comes a point where you have to draw the line and say, um, you know, I'm, I'm different. <laughs> uh, while I, I want to be able to, to meet you where you're at and, and bring you the gospel in a way that you'll understand, 
Um, I, I, you also need to see that what I am is, is not, you know, I'm a new creation in Christ. And so it's going to affect the way I live my life. All right. The other thing that I thought was interesting is that, that they had a lot of control over its members. Uh, and they would confiscate their belongings and force them to break off relationships with friends and family. When you start doing that kind of stuff, you're almost heading towards a cult then. Yeah. Now, I can understand if if their friends and family, their former friends and family before they became Christians, um, were having a bad influence on them. I can see, you know, talking to them and saying, hey, uh, what kind of influence is this person having on you? Um, you know, can, is, are you able to, uh, resist temptation when you're around this person? Um, but, but that's a really fine line there. And, uh, it's very easy to cross that line. And, and yeah, you know, um, there's a lot of different cults that, that will cut you off, uh, from your family and family, especially I have Pretty hard time with telling people to not associate with them. Yeah, I would too. I would think that I just have a real problem with that. Um, the confiscating their belongings is weird too. You know, in in the early church, a lot of people just kind of gave their belongings uh, for the most part to the church, um, or some gave it all to the church and trusted that God would still take care of them, and that's great. But it wasn't forced on anybody. We're living in a dictatorship. And they are forcing it on people. So, I don't know. This, um, it, this also reminded me, right, this guy became a Christian. I guess it was like 12 years um, from when he was imprisoned until, uh, until he founded this ministry. And, and I don't know when he became a Christian during that time. But... Um, and this brought to mind First uh, Timothy three six, uh, talking about the uh, description of the qualifications. Uh, I don't know if that's the right word, but uh, a, a pastor should have certain qualities, and one of them is not a new convert, lest being puffed up he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Um, in other words, the guy's got to know what he's talking about before he goes out to do the work of a pastor. And uh, you know, for this guy, you know, I'm just kind of wondering because it sounds like he set out with good intentions. Uh, this organization has different chapters uh, around the country. But uh, it sounds like they've kind of gone astray in his attempt to reach the um, the kind of rougher element. Uh, he's kind of gone too far and, and kind of gone over to them instead of bringing them over to him. If you only knew the power of the dark side. One of the guys even said that. He said, you know, it was that this guy really kind of wanted just to have a, a reputation. He wanted to have, um, you know, be somebody in the biker world, and he kind of put on a Christian facade, but, you know, recruit, and the bigger, the badder, the better. I got a bad feeling about this. And, you know, that was kind of his, em his emphasis more than really a, a true uh, desire to reach out with the gospel. And it's also hurting other Christian bikers because there are, you know, legitimate Christian motorcycle groups. Uh, there, here in Iowa, there have been groups that have done uh, rides for to promote, uh, oh, cancer awareness, Red Cross, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. And uh, they do kind of fundraisers to help these different charity organizations. And um, and so, but then you've got, you know, people see, yeah, I mean, you know, generally you say motorcycle gang or, or something like that. Um, it, it tends to conjure up pretty negative images. And so while these, these other Christian groups are trying to uh, get, you know, beyond those images, and, you know, and I've seen some of these uh, people in these motorcycle groups and, you know, not all of them, but a lot of them are, you know, they're, they're decked out in your, your typical, uh, you know, black leather and tattoos and, you know, this sort of classic motorcycle look, you know, and, you know. Really, they're decked out in what, 
day I'll wear some church on Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> We're in trouble. Yeah, not quite. Um, don't have a motorcycle. Yeah, man. man. You know, he's got a leather all, you know, and you know, the tattoos across the back. You know. Yeah, yeah. And I climb into my Harley Davidson minivan afterward. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, uh, hey, let's move on to Bone of My Bone here. Um, and uh, this uh, Transfiguration Greek Orthodox Church. And which the bone of the uh, of Saint Andrew was stolen. Yeah, this is in Massachusetts. Yeah, it's right up there in Lowell. Uh, I can believe, by the way, that things would be stolen in Lowell. Lowell's not an area you really want to go to. But uh, <clears throat> now it's interesting that every uh, Orthodox church has a relic buried in or near the altar. I did not know that. Why? So. Uh, I can't remember. A Greek Orthodox pastor actually explained it to me. A priest explained it to me one time. But uh, they, 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 like Roman Catholics, are very big uh, on relics. And this was a silver box, and uh, in it was supposed to be an actual bone of, of um, St. Andrew. And it was, you know, passed through many generations, and the church acquired it six years ago, and it sat on a mantle in a wooden shrine made the painting of St. Andrew. And they just thought this was really cool to have, I guess. But now it's been stolen. So I have two questions. First of all, why would you steal a bone of a guy that's been dead for 2,000 years? Um, it's not like you can sell that on the black market, I would think. Um, you know, it'd be pretty easy to trace. Um, my other question, and this is one that I've raised on the show before, who got the brilliant idea that exhuming bodies and distributing the bones to various uh, churches would be a respectful thing to do to the saints? Disgusting. I just don't get that. I don't know. I read this, and my first thought was Luther once said, Jesus had 12 apostles, and 20 of them were buried in Germany. <laughs> Impressive. You know, I just, you know, the whole idea of, you know, that, that, that you're going to have this, you know, piece of this person. I mean, how do you authentic, how do you authenticate it? Ask him. I guess, you know, but how do you authenticate that, that this is actually St. Andrew's bone? Uh, DNA. Well, you could at least, you could, you could. Well, the only way you could do that is, if, you know, how do you know it's St. Andrew's DNA? How do you know it's not John the Baptist's DNA or somebody else's DNA? I mean, how do you or prove Pontius Pilate's for that one? You could, you could narrow it down to a certain degree. Um, like, you could probably tell if it was Jewish DNA. Um, you could you could also take DNA samples from all of the various St. Andrew... And this would actually be really interesting. Um, all the different supposed bones of St. Andrew that are out there. And uh, first of all, it would be interesting on how many duplicates there are. But, um, uh, you know, of... of bones that shouldn't necessarily be duplicated, but just to see whether the DNA matches on all of these, are they all actually from the same person? And, you know, nobody's ever going to do that, but they really should. Are you incapable of restraining yourself, or do you take pride in being an insufferable know-it-all? Yeah, really. I don't know. I can't think of anything else for us to be talking about tonight. Can you? Nope. nope. And we got a kind of a late start, so let's go ahead and, and wrap, wrap this up. things up here. Always interested in your comments at uh, podcast at crossfeednews.com. Yep. So um, please share with us your thoughts and things. And you can also, uh, I've 
started up on uh, Twitter um, with an, an account where I'm, it's the Twitter name for any Twitter uh, users out there is CrossFeed News. And so you can find me at twitter.com slash CrossFeed News. And there's a link uh, at CrossFeedNews.com. And uh, so love to interact with you that way. Go ahead and give me a follow. And also a reminder that if you see any interesting religious news stories, uh, by all means, post them up on CrossFeedNews.com. Uh, if you are not sure how, uh, drop us a note and we'll be happy to, to walk you through it. But basically, you just uh, sign up there and uh, we won't, we don't uh, collect email addresses or anything, you know, or anything like that. And, uh, and then you just click on uh, create web link, I believe it is. Um, or you can download the, uh, if you use Firefox or Internet Explorer, uh, you can get the CrossFeed News uh, 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 toolbar. And that has a CrossFeed This button where you can actually you just select some text uh, from the story that you want to use as your summary. And you click on that button and it'll open up a new window. Uh, and it'll automatically fill in all the information. And if you want to leave a comment along with it, you can do that. Uh, there's also a bookmarklet on the site that if you uh, don't use that or you don't want to use another um, uh, toolbar, if you want to just, like, for instance, I typically use Safari, uh, you can just drag this bookmark to your uh, bookmarks bar or, you know, add it as a, uh, bookmark uh, to your menu or whatever, and then when you find an interesting story, just click on that, and it'll pop up a window the same way. So, um, and and by all means, leave comments uh, on the site. If you see interesting stories there, leave comments there. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, and um, you know, really want to make this a, a a community, not just a couple of guys sitting talking to each other. Well, we do that too. Yep. Hey, everybody. Good night. Have a good week, and we'll talk to you next week. Yep. Good night, everybody. God bless you.